this one. And then the other one. I will do you need a motion to come out of recess? I do need a motion to come out of recess. I'll yes. make a motion to come out of recess. Second. I have a motion to come out of recess from Councilman Merrill and a second from uh, Councilman Holmgren. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. That motion carries 5 0. And let's see, where do we leave off? We were E. Or, well, do you, let, let's, let's finish out the rest of this stuff. Uh, we've got the microphone discussion, uh, and then we'll go on to E2, was the last thing we had then. So, uh, the microphone discussion, I was going to try to get in here earlier and just look at it. Yeah. I mean, but I. So, Ms. Strand did um, reach out to our uh, audio people who work on our equipment here. And it, the equipment um, microphones are specific to ensure that not only can the audience hear, but to ensure that we get on the recording. So it's got to attach to the rack in that back room. They were able to find a slightly cheaper option, which is before you. Jean passed it out before the meeting. Um, that's this quote here. And going with a wired lapel. So the quote before that we had um, was a, a different, um, it had its own. Um, and then if you want to get really expensive, which we did not provide to you, was to do a wireless lapel. So this is a wired lapel option, uh, and the quote is 2,986, and that does include for them to pull the new wires, detach what you currently have in front of you. Uh, we can't do it in addition. Uh, that was also one of those really high quotes, because then we have to add to the rack. <coughs> We're out of space to add any more ports there without adding, I'm sorry, adding more microphones without adding more ports which then just amplifies, adds five grand, like right off the bat. You can't use splitters? It's just a splitter that makes one outlet into two? We oh. asked for the cheapest option and they didn't come up with that, so I guess I can't hmm. say. Um, <laughs> they was, said to add another rack. That That's, yeah. So I have always so not We been could maybe just take a little field trip. So you're saying that that, that <laughs> office over there is, that's where we need to plug in? Okay, let's actually look at it. Cause that's <laughs> you going on a field trip? <laughs> a wheelchair for me? So I have, I have a question. You had said that we need to make sure, what makes it complicated is we need to make sure the recording hears it and the audience. Um, I don't, th personally, I don't think the people in the audience ever necessarily have an issue hearing us. No. So I don't know if that's something that we could maybe look into. Well, that's the question. So is because we don't, um, we care about you. <laughs> but we don't really are, have a concern about the audience hearing. It's to port through so the Facebook and the YouTube right. pick it up. Right. So would it be, could we do something more if we just said we don't need the, through the speakers in here necessarily? I mean, would that, because you said I think that that's it's, a, I don't, we're not paying extra for going through these speakers. Um, we're paying extra to get it to go into the rack system of that, the Crestron system. Okay. Which is the, the key, the, 
the encoding in this that allows us to stream it to Facebook that's all through the same system. Okay. Have we ever talked to another AV company? Well, we used to have quite a few terrible ones in the past. Um, okay. the, the one we have currently, we've spent tens of thousands of dollars on this system. Uh, we were quoted, I think, a 60, we spent last time 69 or 67,000, 66,000. Very expensive. Um, we were quoted a lot more, and we finally found the company that we have, which was able to get into the you know, I hate to say, back door of the system and work on it uh, because the company we had was crazy expensive. Okay. So he would not have recommended this system in the beginning. Um, he doesn't think that that is the best audio equipment, but he does work with what we have. Otherwise, we'd have to do a full replacement. So I know I, I want to look into what LMC has in their meetings because they have they have room microphones and people can zoom and everybody's, their system is amazing. So I don't know what they have and how much it costs, but I've always thought a single room, room microphone would, would do the job. I don't, we keep going into these routes of having different mics for everybody and it costs a lot of money, but why don't we just have one that just records? Wasn't the room is, is that, wasn't the room microphone like $8,000 or something like that? Didn't we? I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was. I mean, we talked about even using more, the iPad. It was a lot more than this was. Yeah, we went. We, we did look at that one. With, I want to say ten thousand or something. But didn't um, we even talk about using the iPad and seeing if that picked up enough audio to just use that? Like setting an iPod up or an iPad or even a recording device up there. They did that once for a while too, and it didn't work out. Yeah. It didn't. And then okay. you got to remember. LMC, League of Minnesota. Oh, I know City. they got all the money. They got more money than we got. No, I know, but I didn't know if there was a simple, I don't know what they use. You don't know unless you ask because I, I've, this has been a thing for me for years coming in here, especially when they started doing the, the videos, like these mics suck. You can, you're, you're here, you can't hear it. You're here, I mean, they oh, suck. Better, there's, there's no they're, range. They're better them. now than they were before. Oh, I'm sure they were, but they came at a cost. I, I just think there's gotta be a, a better way and I don't know about the, I don't, I necessarily don't believe that they can't be split, but I'm not an expert on it. I would maybe ask them if there is a splitter option. Maybe they just didn't cross their minds. I do think that they are, they do have the ability to pull forward. I mean, if that cable oh, right. the cord is long enough, right. if you, if, if we got in the habit of holding it, no matter where you go, it's going to be following you. It's like the price is and right. And we can... <laughs> Ensure that you're heard if you're holding it. I think the challenge is, is when you get to be a few feet away, or they don't you're pick up anything over here, it's, it's not going to pick you up. These mics, because of what they are and what we originally paid for them, you do got to speak right into the, the little capsule. They call so could we sell them? Very directional. I guess I didn't ask if there's no, a resale value a on it. I'm not because sure. Because if we I mean, could replace these piles of junk with a lanyard one that's just always on us, you. Because these are a lot of money, and they suck. Let's um, look into that. Take a little bite out of that cost. Oh, and I think you probably could get away with with five of them, even instead of seven. If you, you know, I mean, not that you can eventually upgrade all seven, but I mean, I don't know what the cost. It doesn't break it down here versus labor versus, you know, I mean, maybe running, you know, but. But when you run, when you run a full, you're gonna run it. Yeah, we need and seven. Run we need these seven. These two down the road. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you're maybe just better off going all, all in. But, but yeah, I mean, I guess I wasn't looking for a decision on it today, but this is considerably less than yeah, what the last bid we had was. The la that was like 43 or 47, something like that. Yeah, I, I'd have I don't to remember what up, it was, but it was, it was 4,000 we something. So. Yeah, and we were looking at more wireless. Wireless was more, quite a bit more than sure. wired, and we figured it didn't really matter if you had a, a tether. No, I think that'd be a reasonable option. You just clip it on and forget it. Mm -hmm. I know with me, with my beard, though, it might. You gotta clip it right here, right on, right? Right here? <laughs> we Our that. shirts, what's that? Oh, on the hat, yeah, there you go. Have a cord hanging, okay. Uh, okay. I think it's a good option if we could look into maybe selling these, because yeah. sell them to some sucker who thinks they're good, but they're not. Well, they are good as long as you're talking into them and as long as you're, you know, I mean, it's it's just, you know, for our operation, it's not always the best, but. I would like to know cord length too, how how much cord they're gonna give us from underneath here to, to us. If we have any extra, if we're gonna have to stay close to the desk, or is there an extra four feet if we lean back? I can ask. Okay. 
Okay. So yeah, we'll dig, get some more info on it, maybe see what the used price of these microphones is going for, and that kind of thing. Because um, that is a that is a big complaint. The people that watch yes, the meetings, and there's there's quite a few people that actually do watch okay. them, and then they're, they're always complaining, well, you have these videos, but we can't tell what's going on because no, we can't hear anybody. So, except for me, they always say they can hear me. But, uh, well, that's true, yeah, I gotta, I gotta be right up here, but. Um, okay. Sounds good. So we'll move on then to our last item is uh, E2, which was the agenda request from uh, Derek ha Hasek yep. okay, on uh, solar stone development. And council members, appreciate your guys' patience with me again um, for, for misunderstanding the timing. So thank you guys for um, accommodating me here later today. My name is Derek Hasek, and I'm here representing uh, Solar Stone um, uh, Partners. We're a solar development company here that's based out of Minnesota. And wanted to talk to you all today a little bit about uh, the Isanti project that we are planning in the area here. Um, to give you a little background about you know who we are as a company, um, What goes into a given project, kind of talk about um, you know, how we're aligning the, the design of the project with local setbacks and the uh, amount of outreach that we've done to date with local stakeholders, um, yourselves included being part of that process here and looking for feedback as we you know, are really um, uh, looking to finalize our design for this, for this project here. Um, and I'll try to go through this as quickly as I can. I tend to talk fast, so if, if I'm doing that, please let me know. Um, so SolarStone has been in business here uh, since 2012. I loved seeing a typo on my presentation on the first slide. So um, <laughs> we, we are uh, Minnesota uh, born and raised here. Uh, we started off in the community solar space when that legislation was passed back uh, uh, you know, about 10, 12 years ago. Um, and we've now moved into uh, both community solar development as well as utility scale development, which is what this project is um, about. Uh, Kind of give you an overview of who some of the principals are at the organization. Kaya Tarhan, our CEO, has been doing this for 30 years, uh, born in Rochester, um, and uh, uh, you know was kind of a founder of the organization. Matthew Keenum is our chief commercial officer. He's an outsider from New York, uh, but don't hold that against him. He's been working in the industry for a real long time, um, and uh, I myself am. Uh, been in the industry about 13 years and, and born and raised in Minnetonka, so just south of here. Um, um, background. And I thought as kind of a you know an overview here, um, I give a little background about the solar development process because I think it's important to give some 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 structure as to what it is that we're trying to do. So as far as you know, one of the first things people ask is why are you trying to do this here, right? And uh, that really goes back to the relationship with the landowner, right? I'm, I'm a fan that you need, uh, you need two main things in our business. You need land and you need something to interconnect it to, right? So um, landowners that we're working with showed an interest in the project. We were able to contract with them. Um, and so we're working, uh, you know, based on that, that structure as a foundation for the project. We also uh, are looking at minimizing impacts to wetlands, floodplains, culturally sensitive areas, um, threatened and endangered species as well. Uh, the process that we go through um, to study these projects and go through the state permitting process is quite extensive. Um, we're, we're generally looking at about six to seven acres of usable land per megawatt. Uh, and so for a 100 megawatt project, we're looking at about you know 600 to 700 acres. This project is slated to be about 56 megawatts, so it's somewhere in the range of 400 to 430 acres. Um, and then as I mentioned, you know, uh, there's, there's a transmission line that runs along Xylite out there. Um, it's, on, it's a 69 kV line. That's kind of what we were targeting as our original plan for this project. As so far as some of the landowner benefits, you know, like why do landowners work with us? Um, there's a couple reasons. There's a significant revenue increase over what they're, you know, kind of managing off the land that we're offering um, today. Uh, more importantly, though, uh, a lot of our landowners look at it as a stable source of income relative to the fluctuating commodity markets that they're used to dealing with. So it's rare that somebody would say, hey, take all of my land and put it in there um, into a project. It's mostly like, hey, we like this idea, take a slice, we'll kind of keep farming over here um, and, uh, and have a little bit more of a predictable long-term income stream um, from your project over here. 
it also helps uh, oftentimes um, this day and age, uh, a lot of legacy farmers don't have kids who want to come in and manage the land in the same way. So it's a way for them to keep the land in their property, uh, or sorry, the land in their family for a period of time. Um, and you know, we do, it's a long-term thing, but it's a temporary use. You know, we're looking at a 35 year use for this thing. And after that, uh, the landowner's uh, heirs uh, will have the ability to do what they want with the, uh, the property thereafter. Um, we also incorporate vegetative management plan underneath the array, do a low growth grass. We use um, uh, native plantings kind of throughout the design, as well as pollinator friendly habitats to, you know, really uh, a couple reasons actually. One, it actually builds a quite a bit of biodiversity under these things relative to the land use today. Um, as well as uh, minimizes erosion that comes off the land. So, you know, we're really thoughtful about drain tile needs, you know, neighboring land impacts, and we want to make sure the, um, you know, the, we're kind of, you know, frankly improving the, uh, the erosion issues that can occur um, on rainstorms like today on freshly tilled land. Um, as well as, you know, we'll be using materially less herbicides, pesticides, and uh, uh, fertilizers on the land. That's just, you know, kind of a common practice these days with farming. Um, that'll that'll go significantly down um, and have a you know a relatively small but some positive impact on the water uh, uh, resources in the area. I have a quick question, if yeah, that's please. okay. So the landowner benefit slide. Um, oh yeah. You want me yeah. To go so I'm just I have a devil's advocate question. What happens if Solar Stone goes out of business and these farmers have all these solar panels here that they're promised they get revenue from? Yeah. How does that work for for them getting their money? Mm -hmm. Because now you have solar panels to get rid of like all this stuff you have infrastructure that's there that they might not know how to get rid of so they're kind of stuck with it how what is the hedge against that for these uh landowners two parts to that so the first is is that we commit to have a decommissioning bond in place with our landowners and all of our leases uh so that's out of the gate right and typically that'll be held with a local jurisdiction the county right it's just like we'll put it up with the county um, they will manage it and it will be part of, you know, any sort of operating permit, right? Uh, but with the Minnesota state process that we'll be going through, um, that is a permitting requirement, not only to get, like it's kind of part of the initial process to show that, hey, look, we're thinking about this. We get an independent third party engineer to come in, assess it, and that's updated every five years. So as, you know, as the project uh, extends over time, labor rates go up, what have you, um, that adjustment is made and we have to fund that that um, decommissioning bond throughout the life of the project. And so if we don't meet our operating requirements, the state can pull it, rip the thing out of the ground, right? If there's a, um, you know, a, a catastrophic event, these things are infrastructure projects. There's insurance. I heard the talk about the light post, right? Consider it a much bigger light post. Um, uh, and so there, there's a couple of backstops there um, that, that you know, protect not only the landowner but the broader community from mm -hmm. that. So if Minnesota comes in and decides to pull the plug, who's on the hook for the cost of that? Yeah, that's, yeah, if you guys if you guys file bankruptcy and you go completely out of business, who would file it? The, who would who would foot the bill? The taxpayers? That bond. The bond. That's yeah, okay. Yep. And and the bond can also have the city of Isenia's name on it. No, we uh, we do one we do one owner on that, and that's a state process, right? That sits with the Minnesota PUC. So typically we can't have it, you don't want to have multiple people on a bond because it can cause all sorts of issues. So we usually choose one jurisdiction. Um, in, in, if, if as an example, we were coming here looking to do a community solar project in Isanti, absolutely. It would be you guys, right? But we've got, you know, um, Isanti County, the PUC, um, Isanti Township, City of Isanti and Athens Township. <laughs> so it's kind of a, a spread around and that's the process that the state has set up is it, it sits with us. Can I ask, uh, are, are state or federal grants or funds uh, available to you to do these projects? Yes, for sure. Um, can, you, can you reveal what percentage of, of that cost is? Oh yeah, sure. So it's, uh, it's, uh, um, there is, uh, you know, all forms of energy have various forms of tax credits, subsidies, uh, cheap, access to land, you name it. Uh, the, 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 the not requirement of cleaning up after themselves, right? So there's all forms of subsidies, okay? For ours, it's called an investment tax credit. So that was um, been around for, I would say, the better part of a decade at this point in time. And effectively what it is, is that um, the, 
we will get a 30% tax credit on the cost of the facility as a, you know, as a tax credit on our, on our liabilities. So that's a huge driver in our industry um, without question. Uh, there's also some additional adders that the recently passed in, uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act. I'm sorry, my CEO may, has, makes a joke about that law, um, and I almost said it. Uh, but um, it, it, uh, there's, some ad there's adders in there, like if you're building it in a uh, low-income um, area where basically there's low unemployment relative to national averages or adjacent to an expiring coal plant, but that, that doesn't apply in this particular area at this point in time. The census data may come out, but we don't expect it to, to, to apply to this area. Um, but that's, that's, that's basically the main uh, driver of, of kind of the funding tax, federal tax credits that come out of that. It's the opposite side of, you know, oil and gas companies that go and rent land on national land for a dollar an acre and do what they do and don't have the same cleanup requirements. It's, it's all circular and all energy is subsidized in some way, shape, or form. So the 30% is federal? It, it, the yeah. state has some huge initiatives going on right now because they want to be green by whatever year it is. Um, so what uh, does, is there state money included in this too? Um, no, you know, we would, we would, there is legislation at the state, uh, like the, the legis state passed legislation around how these things are taxed. And so there's, um, uh, you know, a, a, a process there around, it, you know, not having it be rezoned industrial and classified that, driving tax, you know, there's a balancing act there. It's. It's basically you pay a dollar twenty um, per every megawatt hour that's produced, uh, and you know that's split up um, between the county and then the townships that it's in. Um, and I, I'm still waiting to get a little bit more feedback from our tax council on how it works having this this be in the city as well. There might be revenues that flow to you guys, and I just I need more time to to sort that out. Okay. It's a little bit of a quirky difference. So my biggest question is, I guess if if it's if it's such a great business, then why is it being subsidized by the federal or the state government? That's the question that I always have for business. I mean, business is supposed to be coming in to provide a service that adds value, make money, and pay itself. So uh, that's, I mean, you said energy all uses that. You know, all energy industries have some sort of subsidy. I guess I'd, to me it just- A thousand percent. Right. A thousand percent. Um, you know, it's uh, um, a couple of answers. That's a very broad question. Right, that, it is. Uh, might be someday good over a beer. Um, the, the uh, you know, the state passed a law that said we want to have a bunch of renewable energy, right? Mm -hmm. There's a reason behind that in that uh, a lot of the uh, economic studies out there show that this type of solar, this size of solar, utility scale solar, is actually the cheapest form of electricity that there is. Yes, there's operational limitations. Sun shines during the day, doesn't shine at night. Thankfully, we have a lot of wind in Minnesota that blows at night. There's a balancing act that goes on there. It's not perfect. It's certainly not, you know, um, um, as consistent as some of the other forms of generation we're used to. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, it's it's cheaper, right? Um, net net, when you take into consider all of the subsidies that go into the various forms of electrical generation, it's like pretty hard to argue that sol utility scale solar is the cheapest form of energy out there. Um, you know, I think second, there's, there's uh, um, residual benefits associated with this that aren't applicable to other forms of, you know, um, of, of energy production, right? Uh, yes, we have to get silicone wafers into, you know, the panels. Yes, we have to produce aluminum, you know, for the framing. Yes, there's tempered glass that goes over the cover it, of it. But if you look net net relative to where you know, uh, uh, some of the other resources out there, natural gas, coal, what have you, you know, those things are produced in far off places. They're driven to, f you know, they're, 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 ha they're having to be brought here to, to utilize. And then, you know, there's the, the environmental repercussions of those that, you know, we don't really need to debate at this point. Mm -hmm. right? um, so I think it's, uh, uh, there's a number of factors that go into it. Uh, and, and, you know, to your other comments, you know, everybody needs electricity. This is like, this is the greatest invention. Um, I'm, I'm biased, but I think the electrical grid is the greatest mm -hmm. invention humankind's ever come up with. 
um, everybody benefits from it. And so there is an emphasis put on, you know, the need to, su to, to supply reliable and um, cheap electricity to the public. And this is just one part of that, okay. you know, goal that Excel and others need to deliver on. Mm -hmm. I guess <coughs> my question would be, what, what benefit do you see for the city to give up over 50% of their R2 residential when that's almost 50% what we have available right now at this time. What's north of there most is the only other chunk that we have. And you know, then we're giving up, I don't know how much park and recreation funds we'd be giving up by uh, turning this all into solar instead of putting developments in there is, and, and that was the intent of the planning commission when we zoned this land. Um, in hindsight, we should have, we should have zoned it R2 um, and we probably wouldn't be having this discussion. Um, so, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, sir. So, yeah, I guess that, that, that's my question. I, I mean, the city is, is giving up. We, we have very little developable land right now. Uh, we haven't had anybody ask to be annexed. And I know this council, we certainly aren't gonna force anybody to give up their land to do future development. Um, that, that, that is one of my main concerns, at my top concern. So a couple comments on that. One, um, in working with our landowner, he actually uh, originally signed up more land and decided to dial it back um, because, of the, because of a concern about exactly what you're talking about, right? Um, wanted to reserve some of that land for um, uh, uh, future development activity, right? Mm -hmm. So could, okay, uh, when I seen it, it yeah. was this whole chunk. So they're dialing back and only using half or a third or? or our, this is kind of the, the, the proposed project area right now, if you guys can see that here. So in, <coughs> you, guys, you guys know your town better than I do, but uh, the, you know, the area to the right is the, the you know, part of the, the whole area you were looking at is also that chunk to the left. So the yellow border is the proposed project area that we're looking at. So the whole piece on the north side that has um, two points on the bottom and yes. one point on the top, that whole chunk. Yeah, that, that's 50% of our developable land within city limits. Uh, that, that's a big concern. So why in, this, why in the city limits and not outside? Just because right. there's, a, there's somebody that's interested in selling it. I mean, I, I, I thought, are other areas denying this as well? Or Here's the, the area doesn't want to tell you and he's trying to be nice about it is we don't have a choice. So that's, that's kind of the bottom line is he's here as a formality to uh, inform us, but the state, the state takes precedent on their decision whether or not to allow this. So well, I, I, don't, I don't believe that. Um, Staff looked into I, it I today. do have a question. How come this wasn't zoned R2? I mean, it's rule. How come we zoned it the way it was until it was ready to be developed? I don't know. That's, uh, this would have been, was this part annexed in in 2018 with everything else or? No, this was way before that. Um, it was requested to be added into the city. I believe that there was an old development way back in the day, way before my time. So prior to a decade ago um, that it, got acquired into the city by their request. Um, but I don't know that that would have made a difference. I mean, it's... So, so we're gonna be forced to change some of our setbacks and everything. We, we don't even have a choice on that. I mean... Well, we can, raise can our, we, we can raise our concerns and the state can ignore those concerns basically and then do what they want. Can't so. we just rezone it R2? I don't believe so, but staff staff did look into some different options if if we were trying to protect that that area, but right. It, I don't think it really matters what it is zoned. There's no way our community is going to let this happen. I, I, there's there's no way. I mean, people in this community are so against solar energy. I I, I don't like the idea of the state dictating what we can or cannot nope. do within the city boundaries. Um, that that's another issue in itself. Um, 
if you guys decide to build here, I hope you have good insurance because people are going to destroy it. I don't. I don't. I, I don't I, think we need I to don't get see into that, that either, kind but, of talk. But but I have another question about you. You were saying wildlife, but I've never been around a solar farm that wasn't completely fenced in. Oh sure, yes, they need to have electrical fencing around. Right for sure. Yeah. Right. But so we're you're giving up. <laughs> that's another forty-four acres. That's just being give up. If it's, I may, it's not environmental of, friendly at all. Yeah, there's been a bunch of comments and questions. Um, I'll try to address them in turn, right? So I think going back to your original question, why there? Uh, and, and maybe, uh, Mr. Council Member Merrill, th it, this was you who brought it up. You know, again, that's why I start with, you know, the landowners in my presentation. That's why we're here. Infrastructure, landowners. There's an interest there. Um, you know, there there is, I view my role as uh, being somebody who is an advocate for our landowners, but also trying to be somebody who's a good neighbor, right? So should a, um, you know, there, I, I believe that there's a balance in somebody being able to tell somebody what they can and can't do with their land, as well as a landowner doing whatever that I, they want I, with their I, land. I right? agree. So I, 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 that's I part of my with role you here. And, and I think, you know, Mr. Mayor, you mentioned, and here is a formality. Um, I, I, I really am here to get honest feedback from people. Um, I really am, right? Um, this, isn't, uh, this isn't me coming in, checking a box. This is me being honestly, legitimately wanting to get this feedback, share some of the conversations that I've had with the neighbors and with other stakeholders in the area. Because, you know, to, to your point, Mr. Merrill, um, or Councilman Merrill, I, I, the other two Fridays ago, I walked around and knocked on every single neighbor's door, right? Every single neighbor's door. I talked to 15 people. Subsequently, five people reached out to me directly and had conversations, and I believe there was one person who said, nah, I'm you know, not really into this. Most of the people looked at me and said, well, this is better than more housing. Bluntly, mm -hmm. that was kind of the response. And so, you know, I think there's two sides to this, right? People, some people don't like to look at it. They like the view of somebody else's farmland. They, you know, even though they're not paying for it, right? There's, again, it goes back to being the balance, an arbiter of, landowner rights versus being a good neighbor, right? So in speaking with those folks, um, you know, I've subsequently changed our design here a little bit, which is in the addendum um, that you can see based on conversations with all of the folks in those um, areas. The blue areas, the blue areas is where we're gonna be incorporating vegetated screening throughout the project area to try and minimize the visual impacts, right? It's gonna look different um, if it goes through, but it really is an idea to um, to try and get feedback, and it's not to say that, you know, if the, the ask is a thousand foot setback from any residential houses, that kills our project, right? So trying to figure out a balance. If there's um, a road that you guys would prefer us to use when we're kind of coming in and going out, that's all part of the outreach effort with the county and with, with the folks here to try and understand where, where and how that makes sense, right? So. I, I know that yes, you know, Mayor Gordon, it is a state process that is accurate. What I am doing here and how much outreach I've been trying to do the area is atypical to other developers that are out there, right? I've spoke to Isani Township twice, Athens Township twice, all the neighbors, happy to come back here as many times as you guys want me to, um, to answer questions and, you know, uh, well, well, take, take on uh, any, any potentially, any, not take on, that was the wrong term, yeah. but here. So, uh, so let me ask you a question. Yeah, please. Straight line winds. About five years ago, I went through and over in Sasago. Mm -hmm. They found these panels four miles away from where they originated from. These will end so up when, this, when that goes and kills somebody, who's going to pay for it? It's all part of the insurance policy. Yeah. yeah when I'm dead, I'm not profiting from it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm hate to tell you. I'm not for solar panels. Just for that simple fact, there is no way in hell you can tell me that you are going to control a straight line wind that's going to keep these panels in base. It ain't going to happen. I, I would never. I would never claim that to. And I. Case. And that's why I'm dead set against them. Minnesota is not a sunshine state. They're probably going to work 40 percent of the time, if not less. If you're in California, Hawaii, Florida where the sun shines seven days a week. Today, you wouldn't have had any sun. Tomorrow, you're not gonna have any sun. The runoff. The runoff. I would like more explanation on that. Um, you, said, you said that the, you guys do runoff stuff. Well, there's nothing that's gonna run off better than the native soil. So how do you address that? Because I think that, that is a big concern with 
environmentalists actually who like the idea of solar but know that it has these drawbacks as well as creating extreme weather conditions. That's that's one thing that's that's been, I don't know if it's true, but there's been a lot of um, information going around that there is a negative impact on extreme weather conditions because the ground isn't absorbing the sun or whatever, whatever that, have you ever heard anything of, about that or any elaboration on that? I don't know if that's a lot of misinformation out there. Okay. That sounds like some of it. That's um, fair. That's a new one for me. To okay. Be okay. Um, uh, and I've been doing this about 14 years, so that's a first. Okay. But that's to, fair. to answer your, your other question, right, um, this isn't going to be a sea of panels stacked next to each other. The row spacing is about 20 to 23 feet in between each of our each of our um, racking systems, which will be a long single axis tracking system. If this is south, I, I'm oriented wrong here. <laughs> they'll, they'll face this, it's this way, I think it means this way. They'll face this way, the panels will sit here. They'll tilt like this throughout the day to track the sun, try to improve the production that comes off. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to the council member's comment, you're right, when it was raining hard today, it probably wouldn't be producing, but cloudy days don't impact them. They're still producing power. And so um, it does. it's not an all or nothing thing, right, um, in that regard. but. As far as the runoff concerns go, that's part of the, the reason uh, in you know, the native soil like you're talking about, right? There are studies that are coming out now that are showing that after having native, you know, native plantings in there, grass cover, um, not treating the soil the way that uh, a lot of farmers uh, you know, do this data, increased production, mm -hmm. which is their right, and that's the ability mm -hmm. to do, the, the, the soil conditions are actually improving because it's sitting there. It's resting instead of being turned over twice a year, right? And so, when these projects are done, yes, they're going to be torn out of the ground. You know, the posts will be torn out of the ground. But again, you're talking a post here, a post there, a post over there, on long racking systems. You're, you're only impacting, you know, a fraction of the overall land. The rest of that soil is sitting there resting, rejuvenating, and a, again, getting the natural kind of biomes going back into the soil. So there's, there's you know, Environmental is concerns, uh, sure, I understand that, but there's quite a few of, of studies out there that are proving that this is actually really good for the soil to let it rest. Can, can you explain to me why Mayor Gordon made a comment that there's nothing we can do about it? Can you explain why? And also, why when we have something zoned residential that, and I don't, care what your argument is, you want to come in and run a business on it. As a business, and you're not going to convince me different. So what, what, are, the, what are the state guidelines on this? You, you must know them to, to the, for Mayor Gordon to make this comment. I, I, I don't get it. Yeah, so the, the, the permitting process for these types of projects that are above 56, or I'm sorry, that are above 50 megawatts, right? Um, that is the process that the state legislature and the, 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 the PUC follow, right? So projects up there, it's not a local permitting process, it's a state process. This is common in states across the United States. Um, and that's just the way they've set it up, right? So the way that the PUC looks at it is that they will take into consideration local objections, local rules, local feedback as you're going through the process that is reasonable, but they also view it from a lens that there is a goal to reach 100% renewables by 2030. And so every single project that they see, um, they have to take into consideration, right? Um, developing these things is hard. It's hard to find capacity on the electrical grid. Uh, that's basically, uh, there was a giggling as you guys were looking in there earlier. It's like, you're, we're trying to plug into the grid and not blow it up, right, or melt the line. That's hard to find. And we found some on this line. We were originally looking at a bigger project, but we dialed it back because of some studies that we, you know, found about the electrical infrastructure out there. So um, high level, that's the reason, right? We're following the process that the state has set up and that all electrical generation goes through, right? Like somebody wants to build a natural gas plant, they go through the state process. We happen to build solar. So we as a city would have a very good argument with the state saying, hey, this project is going to take 50% of our residential development land you know, we, we would not like to see this project go through. Otherwise, what are our options as a city? Do we, is a, it, let's say, what have you seen in the past when, in a circumstance like this, where city was being objective towards 
having a project like this done. Like, I, like Council Member Merle said, this, this should be more out in the township and, and not using valuable city land. That's um, I, I, um, I have been to a lot of these meetings um, and I've heard various answers. You know, there was the annexation discussion. Uh, there's talking to other landowners in the area that might want to open their land up for uh, that type of zoning and development. I, I can't speak to you know the processes around that. Most of the time, um, you know, I, I guess I, I wouldn't say we get a ton of you know a ton of pushback because oftentimes uh, folks look at you know the landowner and say, okay, this is his wish. He's a he's a paying member of our community. If this is what he wants to do, so be it. And and Derek, you would be shocked to know that that is exactly how this council normally decides. Yeah. based off of your conversation you're having with us. Yeah. But that is, I mean, we are libertarian leaning, if you will, yeah. on, on land very, use and how that, how that should go. But I think we're, and, and myself especially, because I say that all the time, these yes. guys are probably so very tired of it. But when you're getting subsidization, I guess I see that as you're asking the government to help you on this side, and I, I see it the same way with low-income housing and, and Section 8, all that kind of stuff that, that you know, if you're getting that, then that's not playing on a free market playing field, right? It's not a level playing field. It's you're using government dollars to come in and do something that our residents will not be be happy with. And as far as the property owners, I mean, if I were them, I would do the same exact thing. I mean, I think I would I would take that money. No, no problem. I think that's the right decision for them. It's the right decision for their families. It's it makes a lot of sense, and, and you're not the one that created the incentive structure, right? And the property owner is not the one that created the incentive structure. You guys are just operating within that incentive structure. So it's I don't fault you guys or the property owners or, or anything like that, but I think that's why you're getting the pushback up here right now. And, and like I said, it doesn't matter. We can voice those concerns, and I appreciate that you're coming in, and, and uh, you seem like a great guy, and I think that, that you're, you're trying to address our concerns as best as you can, and I think you're doing a good job of that. But uh, but that's that's the reason that you're getting that attitude. It's not it's not that we, we we if we were the property owners we'd do the same thing, and if we were you guys we'd do the same thing and we'd operate under that same incentive structure. And it's not your fault or the property owner's fault or anybody's fault except for the people who create the incentive structure. So, but that's why you're getting that pushback because we we just we we do, we we do want the property owners to do what they want in almost every situation except for situations like this. When the and, state decides that they have the power versus their residents. That's where the issue is. You, you got government coming in and telling us that we have to do this, even though if we took a poll in our community, there is no way that this would ever come through. And that's where I draw the line. Um, I, think it, I think it's an issue. I, I also think, uh, I have another question about the bonding. You said it's bonded. So how much is that, how much does that bond for and how much does that cover? Say well, if you guys. It, it's, what he said was it's the, it'll cover the complete cost of removal of that. And as labor goes up and as costs go up, he said it'll, they'll adjust and they'll, right? So, right. so it'll always be, it'll, it'll fluctuate based on the cost to, to do the cleanup process. Okay, what about the economic impact of all the panels after you have to get rid of them? How, are, how is the bond account for any of that? I mean, you have to do something with these things. They have to go in a landfill. You have all this waste that you just mm -hmm. took out of the usable goods that other people can use. I mean, that's it's not a small solar farm. That's a, it's quite a few panels. It's not like it's a small little amount of waste. Yeah, a couple questions or a couple comments I'll try to address there, right? Um, first one is, yes, that's correct. It's all included, right? That is the removal and the disposal of okay. the equipment, right? So it's all of that. Um, a fair amount of that equipment is recyclable, right? Okay. So you're talking about the, the steel piles that go into the ground, right? Mm -hmm. um, that is recyclable. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the aluminum framing around the panels themselves. That's recyclable. And that bonding pays for the separation of the, of the, the waste, so you have to pay somebody to take all that stuff Correct. apart. That bonding yes. does pay for that sort it's of dismantle. Yeah, it's a full decommissioning and disposal. It's okay. not like, yeah, they're not going to just pull it up and s stack it over here. Right. Um, okay. Well, that's. I just want to make sure yeah. because the state makes a lot of um, a lot of fumbles on a lot of things. I, so I don't, <laughs> I don't disagree um, on that front for sure, for sure. Um, and then I th there, I think there was a second one there about the recyclability of the panels themselves. Yes. Um, so so 
uh, I'll be honest that right now is a time and place. You're, you're, you're going to love this, right? Um, you're just <laughs> going to love it. There are some tax incentives in the IRA to support um, building technology around the recycling of these panels, right? Um, and so there are uh, firms out there that are getting serious about it. Right now, it's, it's difficult to make the economics of that work like it is other forms of recycling. Um, call it the plastic bottle recycling myth that uh, we've been sold for my whole life. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, so right now, it's not an economically viable thing, similar to like the steel, right? Um, but <laughs> uh, there is a lot of, of gusto and research going into that. And there are, some, there are some new, there's probably four or five of firms out there that are building plants that are actually starting to figure out ways to recycle not only the uh, the tempered glass, you know, the, the the copper wiring out of that, you know, the aluminum the aluminum siding. I mean, it's the silicone wafers are starting to get into that. My get my guess is in ten years these things are all recycled, right? Is in, and I can't say that with certainty, but that's okay. Based on me looking into this and getting this question a lot, that's what I've seen and how it's evolved over the last, call it like eight, nine, ten years. Okay. I, I wish we would have had more time to really look into this. I didn't realize this was given, getting Neither shoved down our throats and that we didn't have a, a choice. Um, that would have made me really do well, a lot Well, I shouldn't say you don't have a choice. So, jo Josie, I mean, if you could kind of tell them what happened to the um, to the council that voted 3-2 to not move forward with it. Was that you? Oh, you didn't tell me that. That was, uh, that was Mike and, and Stephanie. That's right. They're not here. <laughs> Anyway, the council that, that the council that, that voted not to approve it is being sued. So, if you want to, uh, I think they told that story on a story that I told them. Okay, so, well, so you do know. Come, okay, that did come from me from okay. a different city, um, not your company um, at all, but a solar farm company is what I was told. But this was told by um, a city staff person that they did deny it and uh, tried to make sure that they couldn't come to the city and they were sued. Now, whether that actually went through with the lawsuit and the city had to pay out a huge fine, I don't know. It just was said in passing. I, I, I'll still vote against it. I still cannot believe. Uh, I don't think they're really asking for a vote. They're just asking right. for comments, so, yeah, but. Feedback. I, feedback, move it somehow. <laughs> I don't know. I had a question. Past council should have made that green space or something <clears throat> for something until it was ready to be developed. I don't think it would matter, George. I think, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's coming the, from the, the state. The state's going to... No, yeah. they, <laughs> if I read correctly, they cannot build on R2. I don't know. That's I mean, why Josie, I'm wondering Josie why they can to, build on Josie R1. Josie talked to the city attorney today, and I think we... I didn't get into zoning with him. Um, I mean, he shared the information that I shared with you about the statute and that the PUC will ultimately make the decision given the size of this uh, project of theirs, and he did not say that if it was zoned something different, you have more say or vice versa. That wasn't part of it. I mean, we just council. We didn't know anything about this until this is the first time. There's no yeah. way you could have known that. Right. It's a, it's a sneaky a thing that the state's doing. In the future, if this you, is were the you going to say something, Jeff? No. I had a question. Is there any battery storage for this facility? Because it's been hooked right into the power line. Um, and the second question, you said there's a lot of grant and a lot of state and federal tax dollars for these types of projects and then the recycling half. How about uh, for local fire departments that have to deal with some of the complications from mm -hmm. this possibly starting on fire with all the, um, the byproducts of when it is on fire, with all the chemicals and stuff that burn up? Really not chemicals, right? Um, it's uh, they're pretty basic technology. Um, um, you know, there are some, you know, there are some small trace amounts of metals, right, in mm -hmm. in the panels um, that would be. This is usually where I pull my cell phone out. You know, like <laughs> less than what is in our cell phones, right? Um, and yes, over a bigger space that can aggregate themselves, but in e each individual panel is very, very small, right? Um, and so, uh, you know. To your point, that's where um, I am. I am still waiting to get back some details about uh, the taxation and how that will flow uh, through the city, the county, and the townships. Right? Um, it, yeah, the city, county, and townships. Yes. So um, there, 
um, I suspect, I don't know, and I can follow up with you guys on this, uh, that um, uh, uh, there is going to be some of the, the taxation that we would pay would flow through you guys, and that would go to cover any number of services that um, you guys are talking about. And Mike did call the county today. I don't know if he heard back on what that tax rate would be. No, I asked him before he left. He had not heard yet, okay. we, so we are unsure. Okay. More than residential, but less than full-on commercial is what I think the, the consensus That's was. correct, yeah. yeah. I mean, generally, like if, uh, you know, in other states, there's pilot agreements, right, that you go out there and we, we would call it, like in Ohio, it's, I th no, what is it? It's, uh, it's I think it's $9,000 a megawatt in, um, in Kentucky, it's 4,000, in New York, it's six, right? Like it's all over the board. Um, uh, but the way Minnesota did it was is they, they did this production-based incentive in the, or uh, taxation structure. And so it's it's really linked to how many megawatt hours you produce in a year. And we're so early in the process that that's like, it, it's speculating for me to give you any sort of number, right? But over the life of the project, it will be in the millions of dollars for sure. I think there's so much pushback because uh, in my mind, there's there's a, a place for the, these types of fields, and it's not in the breadbasket of America. You, around here, we're, we're the place where you go and grow food. You grow food. This type of project, I feel, should be in the middle of a desert and set up transmission lines like we do everything else. And then, you know, if there's a straight line wind and it lifts the panels off, you're in the middle of a desert. So that's just my two cents. It doesn't. It doesn't make any sense at all. Jeff, do you remember that fire that we did have down at it the solar? So how, yeah. How did that? Uh, now I couldn't go near it. Uh, yeah. I think the the panel box that was on fire was designed to stay closed and to stay away from it because of, of the chemicals. So you basically just had to stand by until yeah. till it burned itself yep, out? Yeah, the company what? sends somebody out and they take care of it. That's common. Mm -hmm. So is there anything like that at this facility that has mm -hmm. a panel box with all the circuitry and that keeps track of all the data? So you're talking about a SCADA system effectively, sure. right? Yeah, so that, that will be, there will be a SCADA system on site. That'll be inside um, um, at our, our, our substation location to monitor, you know, the generation that's mm -hmm. coming off the array. Um, the, general, the general way that these things are laid out is This project here, right? So this is a decent picture. Um, we'll have groupings of panels in the rows, like you're seeing here. And for every, call it seven to eight to ten megawatts, it depends on um, what kind of inverters you get. But there will be an inverter out there. Um, we centrally locate them away from, you know, the 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 the, the exterior of the facility. And you have all the panels that collected on DC electricity go into the inverter. That flips it to alternating current, which we use, you know, here. And um, then those will have what are called home runs. It'll go back to a main power transformer that will step up the power, inject it into the grid. That's effectively what you got. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as far as to your point about things that catch on fire, I, you know, um, really doesn't happen that often. Yep. When it does happen, it's like, oh, my gosh, these things catch on fire. But the, no. the, the history of them, it's, a, you know, an inverter is a time, you know, a very old piece of equipment that is built with all the national electrical codes that are required for it. Um, you know, you're right. If one of those things catches on fire, generally stay away from it. Let mm -hmm. it burn itself out because we don't put the panels really close to it. There's a, there's a, a setback there to kind of minimize the potential damage there. And then when it's done, it's cleaned up, replaced, replugged back in, and uh, we move on with the operation. So you said that it was converted from DC to AC. Um, do you know roughly how much power loss is in that process and it gets transformed up? Do you know how much power loss is there? And is there any technology coming that you might not actually have that sort of power loss? And yeah. Losses are a big uh, I know they're question. A, yeah. Um, so, you know, these things basically operate in the range of, call it like, you know, I want to say it's at this day and age, it's around 28% efficiency, mm -hmm. right? Um, yes, as you're moving power from one place to another, you're stepping it up and down. There are incremental losses right. in there. 
um, you know, when we design these, uh, you know, we try to, you try to keep them in a box, right? Because if you have a long thing like this, you're going to lose power over here that's coming back to the area. So there are, um, I, I, it's usually when you're getting above a mile that you start getting concerned about, you know, material line losses from a, from a given um, um, inverter section. Um, but it's not, it's all just part of the process, right? Okay. I wouldn't call them material by any means, it's, but there is, there are losses that, that occur. You know, as a city, we're, we're allowed to set an ordinance or uh, safety features on, on, on building different things. Um, but yet, you're saying on this solar farm, we would have no input whatsoever that the state and the Fed regulate it and whatever their standards are, even if it may go against the safety of our own citizens, um, like flying solar panels, um, there's nothing we can set in ordinance to require stricter safety. That's literally why I'm here, is to have that conversation with you guys. If there are things that you would like us to incorporate into our um, system design that we can accommodate, right? Like there's a balancing act there. Mm -hmm. um, that's the set thousand foot setback that I was talking about. Like don't put an inverter 2,000 feet from a house. Well, that's really difficult in this area, right? So um, if there are things that you would like us to consider as part of our safety and operation management plan. Literally why I'm here. Okay, good. I, so And, and, and something that like, you know, we don't need to have a conversation about it now, today, good. like you guys got my card, like if you want me to come back in a couple weeks, in a month, whatever makes sense, like happy to make myself available again. When are you, they thinking of starting this project? Or is oh, there a start well, Yeah, we're way out. So the, let, let me break down the process a little bit and I, I promise to be brief here. Um, there's a bunch of steps to this process. The first of it starts with getting the land, right? That's the number one thing we do. Second thing is we put in for an interconnection application with the utility. We did that back in September of 2021. So we've been sitting on this for a very long period of time because until we have an understanding as to whether or not we can actually plug this into the grid, all we really do is try to get enough land for what we think we're gonna be able to build and we wait. We don't do this outreach. We don't give people in a tizzy because until we know that we can actually plug it into the grid, we don't have a project, mm -hmm. right? So that's a really big gating item. We got those results back in September of, well, October of 23, um, two years later, right? It's a long process. It's <laughs> painfully long is the only way I can describe it. Um, so at that point in time, we started looking at, okay, what size do we wanna make this thing? Let's start all the studies. You know, and to pull together um, this uh, this general like buildable area, this effort takes about six months of work to do all the studies that go into this and be able to say, look, this is this is really what we're thinking. And so, you know, oftentimes people are like, oh, this has been happening behind the scenes, and I'm not implying you were saying that, council member. It's just there really isn't anything for us to talk about until we get those initial results back, right? So we got those. We're waiting on the second round of results, which we're supposed to be getting here in um, end of June, sometime here soon. And that is just another wave of studies where uh, a bunch of people will put in for interconnections all over the place, and then they'll get results and a bunch of people will drop out. And um, you know, uh, then they restudy again and they recalibrate what your costs are gonna be. And then they restudy you one more time to figure out how much it's gonna cost to actually interconnect to the grid, the facility that you actually will plug into the grid. And at that point in time, you sign a GIA, um, you hopefully have your state permit in place, and then you've got somebody who's willing to buy the power from you or the project is the utility, whatever, however that might work, right? And so um, what we're looking at for this project is, you know, I would expect nothing to really occur until probably 2026 at this point in time. So it'd be like a Q2, Q3, 2026 construction timeline. Um, and that is entirely dependent on how fast the utilities and the, um, the regional transmission operator called the Mid-Continental Independent ISO, uh, Independent System Operator, MISO is what they call it. They oversee basically all the utilities like you got Excel here is a big one. You've got Alliant down in Iowa. You've got Madison Gas and Electric over in Wisconsin. All these guys, you know, all these entities' powers flow together. MISO oversees how all of that energy moves and flows at the transmission level, right? 
So it's an iterative process with them and until we get through that, like we're not gonna do anything. That's a gating item for us. And so I would expect that to be done end of 25 into the beginning of 26. We'd be looking to start construction when the ground isn't frozen. Um, Cause that doesn't work really well here <laughs> in June, in January and February. So uh, any more questions? I mean, you guys got my contact information. Feel free to reach out anytime. Um, this is the point where I always say, if I don't get back to you right away, please forgive me. I got three small kids and I, I, I'm pretty busy. So it might take a day or two, but I promise I will get back to you. Um, and again, if you guys discuss amongst yourselves and you'd like me to come back uh, in a time frame, happy to do so. I was just gonna suggest that I would like to see this on the next COW and have a discussion about it and then um, have you back, like it's up to the rest of the council, maybe in the future. Uh, yeah. Because this is the first we really were explaining what's going on. Totally. And that way we can all kind of look at it and everybody has time to relax a little bit and, and, and get this figured out and we'll have numbers by then. And mm -hmm. Yeah, happy to. Um, I'm here as a resource, uh, so please feel free to use me in whatever ways uh, appropriate. And, and, and Mayor Gordon can say more eloquently that, you know, we're all pro-business and, uh, and we all believe people should have the right to do what they want with their land. It's just this is uh, something thrown in the loop that I don't think anybody foreseen. I, I certainly didn't. Um, and, and I'm still concerned about losing 50% of our residential land for the future. So we'll... Get everybody comfortable or uncomfortable with the idea, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think uh, so. George, you were wanting to, to see if maybe he'd come back next committee of the whole meeting, or no, what do you no, want? No, I'd like us to discuss it ourselves okay. and then decide whether we want him back to ask more questions and okay. get more feedback. And when do we have to submit? I mean, our concerns. If uh, if we have any, so oh. let's see. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's there's a there's multiple public um, um, hearings that will be that will happen as part of this overall process. Um, we're in we're kind of in the final phase of uh, of um, trying to finalize our design. We're looking at doing the permit probably in July and August at this point, um, um, just because of the delays with. Uh, process um, it's a I won't go into it it's hilarious um, they, they say it's gonna take three months and two years later we get a study um, it's, it's ridiculous um, but uh, so th that's our general timeline is like Ju July or August so um, you know maybe a month or something like that I don't know I'd be happy to come back again in, in a month or um, whatever makes sense like just let me know the public meetings that you described when where will they be held? Or yeah, it'll when? be local. They'll, they'll be, um, it'll be a, a local venue around here somewhere. Okay, so like a community center? Yeah, exactly. Yep, okay. yep. And it'll be, we'll have all, all of the experts there talking about, you know, our biologists talking about all the studies we did associated with it, our construction people describing the process, you know, our regulatory people explaining, you know, the steps in there. Like, it's a, it's a, it truly is an opportunity for people to come in and learn and provide comments, which um, if we're town council member Merrill's comments, I'm sure we'll get some. <laughs> Josie, what were you gonna say? Yeah, I do have a question, sure. Derek. So is, with you coming to the city right now and doing this information session from the council, does that um, qualify, so to say, as our, our notice that the project is happening, or do we actually get a formal notice like in the mail? Yeah. It's a good question. Um, so yeah, this you will be notified of the public hearing that's okay. coming up. This this like this is informal. This is okay. This is not required. Okay, um, just wanted to yeah, no, for verify. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Good question. And all the townships will Very be notified too. Yeah, okay. yeah, for sure, for sure. Mm -hmm. As well as the neighbors, right? Like it, it'll yeah. be a, a full a full thing. So okay. All right. So maybe we can add that to committee of the whole for next month and. Uh, any other questions for, for Derek?
Thanks for coming in. Oh yeah, thank you guys for having me. And again, appreciate the grace on my uh, my slip up on the schedule. Right. So thank no you guys. problem. That's thanks. Right. Thanks for hearing our questions and answering yeah, them. Sure. Yeah. And sure. we're a very tough council here. Well, like I said, I mean, it's not. It, it is the incentive structure that you're operating in. I mean, it's the way I kind of would look at it is like the the uh, during COVID we had uh, the PPE money, right? So I mean, my my business. I mean, do I think that the PPE was a great idea and a great government idea and something that they should have absolutely done? Uh, certainly not you know I mean I think it that's a bad deal but am I gonna let my competitor down the street take advantage of that and I'm not going to well that's a stupid idea for my family so I mean it's it's I don't I think you guys are doing what you're incentivized to do and and it's it's the issue for us I think is more in the fact that it's it's subsidized domain. and it's and it's they're taking control away from the local entity and so but uh, but I think if I were you guys, I'd be doing the same thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, <laughs> so, so I can't, I can't fault you, and I appreciate you, you uh, uh, coming in and answering these questions, and and we we certainly certainly appreciate that. So, um, okay. Any other uh, thoughts on the uh, agenda there? So. Oh yeah, cool. Thank you guys very much. Yeah, thank you. Talk about F2 or F3 or any of that at the moment. Uh, well, we did talk about F1 and F3, and F2 was uh, the dogwood speed discussion, I guess, um, which I think at this point uh, we're changing the 25 mile an hour speed limit. So, I mean, I think that hopefully will solve that problem. So, okay. so yeah. Nice uh, to just cross it all off the list. Well, I think the election stuff we should bring back yeah. next time still, um, and probably should just, yeah, I mean, I, I think that. I don't really want to dig into it right now because I don't have a great idea on how we can improve. There was one thing that we had talked about as far as the city's, you know, part of that, but I would need to probably talk to Angie and kind of find out for sure what is actually our part, what can we change, and, and I don't know if we would have to debate on whether or not it's worth messing around with that, with the way that we're doing that now. So, um, but anyway, I'll, I'll have to dig into that a little bit more and then, uh, Six five overlay. I think that's that's coming along real great. So, I have one quick random question: Is the color of ink they use on a ballot matter? No. Okay. The red. You can use a red pen. It's can advised you? not to, but you can. Okay. That is one question because I asked. Somebody asked me the it. other day. They thought their ballot was invalid because somebody handed them a red pen. And it would it would trigger a system. Um, they would have a under vote, so they would say that there are so many people registered, and but then they would it would trigger a system, supposedly. I don't know. You're supposed to not use a red. Don't pen. use a red you, pen. Yeah, I mean, I think Angie said they bought like forty thousand pens when they had COVID and stuff we going. Lots, we do have lots of pens, but I do think that, and Angie is would be the expert, but um, it would go into the spoiled ballot bin, so you still would have that. Okay. So if it would it, if it rejected it, like if it didn't read it, it's not like it just gives a null vote, you know. What about a Sharpie? Can you use a Sharpie? I would think that a Sharpie would show up. Black. You didn't ask? You, no, I didn't think <laughs> about a Sharpie. I, was, I just know I heard that the city of Isenia was using red pen, or had handed out a few red pens accidentally. accidentally well, I, somebody bringing in their own pen and leaving it behind or something. It's, it's hard to say. Yeah. Uh, Right. Yep. And that's what she had said too. But they do still work apparently. But just if you're voting, try and use blue or black. Yeah. All right. Anything else? <laughs> Travis looks like he just—he's already <laughs> sleeping. So we, <laughs> motion, motion to motion. adjourn. Well, can I just clarify? We are taking off dogwood then. I think we could take it off for now. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody yep. talk to that property owner? I have not talked to Troy uh, recently, but. I mean, at the speed limit issue, I mean, I think we could try that. And There's what was the our... Peak speed was like 58 miles. It miles was, right? but I was curious to see the average speed was like 21. Yes. Which I was like, hmm. Yeah, yeah. if you looked at the, the, those the outliers. outliers were big. Yeah. But there was like three speeders that day, right? Yep. Or one or three was the biggest day and maybe one or two over the speed limit. But the average is 20, so... But still, 58. Those <laughs> outliers, and that's... <laughs> that's all I... You could see why you could see why people are upset. I will get you, yeah. miles I will hour. get you the next data set out. We'll be I'll pull it tomorrow because this is on public record. So we'll pull it tomorrow, but the speed sign's up there and there's no display. 
Ah, oh, I'll see if it changes. Just to see if it changes. So when you see that, come out. <laughs> just to that. see if somebody's <laughs> purposely trying to see how fast they can go. Just, just interesting to see what that will show. Yeah. So that will be the next data set we'll pull up tomorrow. Okay. Is there, I, I hate to even ask, but is there, there's photo enforcement ones of those? There are. Like, how But we, you, we can't write a ticket yeah. on those. Oh, okay. I, I hate the idea. Of, I mean, I, they tried I that with five years ago. Yeah. But yeah, you can't enforce okay. speed. I hate the idea, too, but if someone's going 58 and a 30. I don't. Oh, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. to have them on a photo I enforcement. It. I think is a no, I mean, I, I was just an interesting. Okay, it. Steve, Steve's got to get going here too. Let's. I'm let's motion to adjourn. <laughs> Steve motions to adjourn. Councilman Lundin, motions to adjourn. And do I have a second? Second. I'll second. I have a s <laughs> second from uh, Councilman Heeman. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. That motion carries five zero. We are adjourned. So did I. Second, I'd like to see you, John.